I'd like to introduce our fourth and final speaker, Professor Joe Trapani from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. So Joe is the Executive Director of Cancer Research at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and he leads the Cancer Immunology Program. Joe's research interests in, in addition to cancer also include the immunopathology of viral and autoimmune diseases and apoptosis induction by cytotoxic lymphocytes and cancer therapy. Joe is also a member of the Executive and the Chair of the Medical and Scientific Com um, Committee of the Cancer Council of Victoria, and he recently received a $12.5 million award from the Wellcome Trust UK to lead a consortium of Australian, New Zealand and Chinese research teams to develop a new class of immune suppressive drugs that protect um, against transplanted bone marrow stem cells against rejection <laughs> mediated by natural killer cells. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. So thanks very much, uh, Dale. And while the slides are coming up, I'll just say I've got the, uh, I think the enviable task of, um, of co covering 120 years of cancer immunology in 20 minutes. So um, the other thing, that while again, while the slide's going up, is let, let me say how we're delighted, everyone, is let me just speak on behalf of all the researchers of Peter Mac. And uh, Peter Mac's got uh, 2,500 employees, and every day, uh, 550 of us actually turn up full time to do research, and for that, for that purpose only, 450 in the labs and another 100 clinically. So, we're absolutely, absolutely thrilled and delighted to be uh, transplanted now into this, uh, to this new wonderful collaborative environment, and we're very much looking forward to collaborating uh, with all of you and all of the other partners in the uh, fantastic and exciting BCCC. So 20 minutes on cancer immunotherapy. I'll use as my starting point this slide, and it really is from the point of view of the cancer clinicians. And although it was in my introduction, I was introduced as clinically qualified, which is true, I'm not an oncologist. I was actually trained in, in rheumatology uh, and clinical immunology. Nonetheless, uh, the oncologists are incredibly happy about the advent of immunotherapy. And that's because immune-based therapies for cancer are the first radically different, completely new way of treating cancer for well over 50 years. We're all used to the three pillars of cancer therapy. Um, we all know about surgery, which has been around since Egyptian times. Radiation therapy, which started with people like Marie Curie in, in Paris over 100 years ago. And then uh, chemotherapy for cancer, which started in Boston just after World War II and was pioneered locally by, by heroes like John Kolbatch, who uh, was a physician uh, who was widely criticised for even trying to treat kids with leukaemia with chemotherapy uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but it's taken, out of 120 years of a history of cancer immunotherapy, it's taken till just the last five years uh, before there's been wide acceptance that the immune system really plays uh, any significant role in cancer and indeed that can be used therapeutically. Now, 120 year history, I'm not going to cover that in the interest of time. Um, uh, but it's, it's fair enough to say that, that the whole field has had enormous ups and downs. The pendulum has swung back and forth on cancer immunotherapy uh, for, uh, for all those decades. But it's really only in the last 20 years even uh, that there's been definitive evidence that the, that the immune system, particularly the human immune system, can mount a cellular immune response to cancer. And that came in the form of the isolation of CTL clones, so CD8 positive CTL clones, capable of killing autologous melanoma cells. So melanoma is a particularly immunogenic form of cancer. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, these were class one restricted, uh, uh, class one presented uh, peptides, uh, typically two types of antigen, either neoantigens uh, or um, widely expressed differentiation antigens such as tyrosinase and MART1, which by the way are shared with normal melanocytes. So it, it's fair to say by the early to mid-1990s, that everyone agreed that most cancers were not particularly immunogenic, and it took 100 years to work, to work that out. Uh, but what that meant afterwards, was there were two, I guess the field sort of branched off into two quite distinct uh, therapeutic strategies. The great majority of uh, labs uh, took a vaccine approach, and I guess the commonest way of, uh, of attacking this and trying to make um, uh, patients more immune against their cancer was to take professional antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, and feeding them various sorts of tumour antigens, either peptides that we knew could be presented on the appropriate MHC uh, antigen, uh, or uh, various other uh, types of tumour antigen. So the majority went down that path. A small minority, including our own, took a completely different view. Uh, and we tried various approaches 
uh, to enhance the cellular immune response outside the body, ex vivo, to amplify that and provide it back to the patient. And that's a form of therapy called adoptive therapy, adoptive immunotherapy. And, uh, and indeed, you know, all the antibody therapies I would class as adoptive, uh, by the way, for whatever purpose. Um, we often forget things like that, but they're actually a form of adoptive immunotherapy. Nonetheless, so I'm going to very briefly discuss the two major modes of immunotherapy that are currently uh, clearly uh, effective in a range of cancers. The first of these is um, called checkpoint blockade, and one could argue that this is a spin-off of the various approaches to vaccination, although in fact, uh, um, vaccination probably underestimated uh, that many patients do form an immune response to their cancer, even if it's a tiny little one. But checkpoint blockade, it is possible to take uh, an approach that fans that little flame of, immune, of an immune response into a very potent therapeutic approach. And the second is adoptive T-cell immunotherapy, which I've just touched on, and of which, in, in fact, there are two major forms. Briefly on checkpoint blockade. So what is it? It's a way to neutralise a cancer suppression of natural immunity to cancer. And the principle here is that um, all immune responses, which of course are normally generated uh, to protect us against pathogens, the external environment, have to be limited. So once you get influenza or sore throat and your lymph nodes go up and, uh, and you react to that pathogen, after a while, and you've defeated the pathogen, you need to get rid of many of those cells. They're no longer required. You need memory cells, but you don't need them. So there are various physiological breaks that are applied to the immune system, and they're normal. What happens in cancer, though, and one of the key findings is that the break, a break, is applied all the time. It's a trick that the cancer cell uses to fool the immune system into not attacking it. So the immune system is, in fact, prevented from, from acting. And effectively, what these checkpoint antibodies do, and they're all um, purified uh, monoclonal antibodies, they've got weird names, I can hardly say them, but ipilimumab was one, the trade names you avoid, or pimbrolizumab, Keytruda, what they do is they interfere with that inhibition. They block the inhibitory signal, they release the break, and they allow the immune system, and its killer cells in particular, the CD8 positive T cells, uh, to actually act. Now, there are a whole multitude of physiologically important checkpoint pathways that could, in principle, be targeted, and a number of them are indeed in development, but the two that actually work therapeutically so far are listed here. One is the interaction between a molecule called CTLA-4, and, and by the way, CTLA, it, it, what actually, the L stands for late. It's late antigen. The antigen comes up late on activated T cells, and we could talk about why that's important later. But basically, that's a molecule that interacts with co-stimulatory molecules, either CD8 or 86 on an antigen presenting cell, and it has a major role. That physiologically, that pathway is imp important in limiting the priming of the immune response. Then the second one that can be interfered with is an interaction between a molecule called PD-1 and its ligands, PDL1 or 2 on APC, and they work, that's an important way of down-regulating the immune system at the end of the effective phase in particular. So one works more at the start and one works more towards the end. Now, um, so what's remarkable about these antibodies is that they actually work, and they work in a, a, pro a proportion, and we're still working out how to use these properly, but even in very, very advanced cases of, uh, say, take malignant melanoma, and I'm talking here about patients who have been through and failed every available form of therapy and have widely metastatic disease, around about 30% respond, and respond often uh, with quite remarkable uh, responses. So what the therapy actually involves is it, it's really very benign therapy. You go into the hospital, you have an intravenous infusion about every three weeks of an antibody, because antibodies are very long lived in our circulation by comparison to normal drugs. And generally, this sort of therapy is very, very well tolerated, perhaps predictably, because we're actually blocking these checkpoints, uh, about 10% develop significant autoimmunity. So I guess um, ab initio, that's not particularly uh, surprising. So here's a, a scan of a patient with multiple cerebral metastases from melanoma and following UFI a few weeks later, they've effectively completely gone. Now, this is absolutely unheard of uh, in cancer until a few years ago. So I, I inquired of my clinical colleagues, um, you know, how many of these trials are going on? So the important point of this slide is that this is not a therapy of the future. This is happening right here, right now, and right all around us. So currently, I'm told, 
There are 28 open immunotherapy trials at our VCCC hospitals. So Peter Mac, uh, the Melbourne, the women's, and the children. And, and Grant MacArthur uh, was able to provide me with some figures around malignant melanoma. Uh, and you can see the growth in these uh, trials. And this is simply looking at combinations, combination therapies of immune checkpoint inhibitors at Peter Mac. And you can see uh, that um, in the last few years, there have been a dozen of these, and uh, only three of them are sick, uh, involve a single checkpoint inhibitor, and the other three quarters uh, involve combinations. By the way, this is a PET scan, so you can basically make an outline of, of a patient's skeleton here, and most of the black bits, excluding the brain up here and the bladder down here and the kidneys in here, are tumour. All the rest is tumour. Uh, and uh, effectively, some weeks later, all completely and utterly cleared. Absolutely, if you believed in miracles, this would be a miraculous cure. I don't believe in miracles, but it's miraculous anyway. OK. And I guess the most celebrated um, um, patient uh, publicly, I can talk about this because it's been in all the newspapers, is Mr Ron Walker, who was, who was treated initially with Hugh Boy or later with Keith Truder, and really was, you know, without putting too much detail into it, uh, very, very uh, close to uh, passing away, quite frankly, with widespread metastatic disease some years ago. Uh, he was treated, uh, so this is Grant MacArthur, his physician, uh, he received a variety of uh, treatments. Now, several years later, is completely in remission and hope, and is really uh, living a very, very full life, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, as I mentioned, not all cancer patients can raise an adequate immune response, and that's where some may be, uh, may be suitable for adoptive immunotherapy. And so there are effectively two different types of adoptive T-cell immunotherapy. One's called, I'll explain the acronyms in a moment, one's called TIL therapy, which is uh, there to sort of amplify an existing immune response. And then there's CAR T cells, where we can actually start with virtually nothing and manufacture a, an immune response uh, in vitro. So T TIL therapy is the precursor to CAR T cell therapy, or at least that's the way I see it. TIL stands for tumour infiltrating lymphocytes. And it has been, they've been noted, so lymphocytes infiltrating cancers have been noted by pathologists for many, many decades and have really been regarded as a surrogate marker for an immune response to cancer. So, so what the therapy involves is that you take a fresh surgical specimen of the patient's tumour, it's, uh, it's disaggregated in various ways in the lab, or, uh, and, and, or in clean rooms at least, and then the CD8-positive T-cells are isolated from what's assumed to be an immunosuppressive uh, environment, expanded and activated with T-cell growth factors such as interleukin-2, and then reinfused back into the patient for therapeutic effect. Now, um, uh, I could obviously talk about this for a long time, but just to, just to really summarise here, a whole number of clinical trials were performed, uh, particularly by one group at the National Cancer Institute, read by Steve Rosenberg, and this, this is still a form of therapy that's, va that's valid and is used, but it's fair to say that overall the response rates have been very low complete response rates of 5% or 7%. And the reason that people have persisted is that when they work, they produce some absolutely remarkable effects. So here are two, two separate cases. Again, disseminated malignant melanoma. Uh, these are the scans of the first patient. This is a section through the liver, and you can see lots and lots of lytic lesions. These are metastatic uh, lesions in the liver. Uh, a, few, a few weeks before the, the uh, beginning TIL therapy, and just five weeks after a couple of infusion of TILs, most of these lesions have completely vanished. And indeed, this patient went on to have a very durable remission uh, for many years. In the end, 3.2 years later, the liver is free of cancer. Here's a second patient, different patient, with a huge um, subcutaneous metastatic lesion, looks angry and inflammatory, and, and a, a neighbouring lymph node. And the point about this slide that's remarkable is this is 12 days later, 12 days after TIL therapy, the entire tumour, and there are many, many grams of tumour here, have, been complete, have completely melted away. Um, quite remarkable capacity of these cells on certain occasions, and this is the problem, it's sort of unpredictable who, who would respond. Um, uh, but occasionally you get those sorts uh, of, of, of responses. But there were all sorts of limitations, and I won't go through those um, here because of time. But uh, in particular, these cells don't survive well in vivo, once you give them back to the patient, they norm you normally require very high doses of interleukin-2 to keep them going, and that's very toxic, and many of these patients end up in the intensive care unit. Uh, it's also easy to shed class one, 
and so um, resi disease resistance and relapse is very frequent. So uh, talk about, you know, sort of the requirement for labs to work with clinicians. Well, 20 years ago uh, in my lab and also in another lab, there are really two labs that started this off. The other one was in Israel led by uh, Professor Zalik Eshad. We took a very different approach and we decided to use gene therapy. Uh, and what this involved is to use um, retroviruses effectively to, ex to express these things called CARs. Uh, so CARs are, CAR stands, it's another acronym, it stands for, for chimeric antigen receptor. So we get the virus to express a molecule that has an extracellular or ectodomain, which is actually an antibody. So it's a, a single chain FV that interacts with antigens on the cancer cell. And then the rest of the molecule consists of a transmembrane domain and then critically a number of signaling motifs in the T cell uh, cytosol. And when the two cells make contact, uh, these signaling motifs are critical for getting the T cell to do a number of things. Number one, they kill this cell, kills that cell by a mechanism uh, which in the lovely movie that Peter showed earlier. The T cells are activated, they proliferate, and if you're lucky, they will persist in vivo. And I'll show you evidence of that in humans in a moment. And they also secrete lots of cytokines, particularly interferon gamma and TNF, and they secondarily set up inflammation uh, in the, uh, in, in the tumour. Now, uh, so we, because um, the, there's um, the single chain FV recognises antigen directly, there's no MHC restriction, restriction requirement here, but optimal co-stimulation is a key. And some years ago, we investigated uh, the difference between having just a single, single signalling mo motif in the cytosol, typically a T cell receptor signal, or T cell receptor plus a co-stimulatory uh, uh, signal through CD28. And Nicole Haynes, who did this work years ago, uh, compared the capacity of these vectors, so Zeta alone, or Zeta plus CD28 signaling, uh, and targeting a, a very important human tumour antigen called ERP2, which is common in breast cancer. I'll just show you one result, which is an in vivo result, uh, with a, a, a breast cancer uh, tumour line from humans that grows, uh, that uh, is ERP2 positive. And you can see in this model that the controlled mice either mice that received no T cells or vector alone T cells were all dead in 20 days. If you gave one shot of effective CAR T cells, uh, then about 30% of the animals that received the single tailed receptor survived long term. Uh, and if you had a TCR signal and CD28 combined, then 80% of these mice actually combined uh, 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 were able to live uh, long term. And this is a very, very aggressive tumour. Now, as a result of that work and many, many, the work of many, many other groups around the world, uh, CAR T cells have been trialled clinically now quite extensively for the last five or seven years. And the results have been really quite remarkable, although admittedly in a restricted number of diseases, and particularly in B cell malignancies, B cell uh, leukaemias, lymphomas, childhood acute lymphocytic leukaemia uh, in particular. So typically, um, the target here are B cell differentiation antigens, particularly CD19, to some extent CD20. This slide's a bit out of date now. There would now be hundreds of, of patients that have been entered into these various trials. But if you take a couple of examples here, we're not getting 5% or 7% responses. We're getting 50 or 70% complete responses. Absolutely remarkable. And let me stress again, these are patients that have been through the entire mill, and I'll show you an example in a moment. Now, that's with, uh, with leukaemia lymphoma of the B cell variety in particular. With solid tumours, uh, much, much, less, much, much less success and, uh, and, uh, and, and, complete, and uh, complete responses virtually unheard of. Now, here's a celebrated patient. She's celebrated because she's been widely publicised, presented to uh, President Obama and so forth. But it's a really, really good example of this sort of situation. So here's a patient... Uh, Emily Whitehead, she had uh, diagnosed with very aggressive ALL at the age of five in 2010. She went through every possible form of therapy, include, including bone marrow tra stelsia transfer. She was effectively on the point of death, uh, was treated with in a phase one trial of anti-CD19 uh, CAR, went into total remission and is completely well four and a half years later. Again, quite remarkable uh, responses. This is going on all around us in Melbourne. There's a very large study um, uh, sponsored by Novartis at the moment that's, um, where the PI is uh, Professor Con Tam at St V's, lately of, of Peter Mack. And um, we're covering a number of, uh, of uh, B cell malignancies here. So re refractory paediatric ALL, 
uh, an adult form of B-cell lymphoma of Peter Mack, fully enrolled, and a number of other indications are coming online very soon. So collaboration with industry is very, very important. And over the road at the new building, we have some wonderful clean rooms, and we can actually make our own cellular vaccines at uh, very, very high levels of GMP specificity. But in addition to these important farm-sponsored trials, I think it's really important we do our own trials. And, and so um, tell you, perhaps if I could spend a few more, a couple more minutes um, telling you a little bit about some work where we're trying to use a similar approach to target an antigen called Lewis Y in solid tumours. And I won't tell you, unless you ask, perhaps tell me later, ask it, uh, explain later, uh, why we think this is a good target. But let me acknowledge uh, right now the fantastic uh, help and uh, support of uh, Professor Andrew Scott and the folk out at uh, Ludwig and the Olivia Newton-John for providing us in particular with a single chain FE antibody. So Lewis Y is not a protein, it's a, it's a glycolipid uh, and it's present in, at very, very high copy numbers per cell, a million copies per cell uh, on 40 to 70% of all common adenocarcinomas. So that includes breast, stomach, colorectal, prostate, pancreatic, you name it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we really like it. And it works in mice. And um, about four or five years ago, there's also actually a, a small proportion of acute myeloid leukemia patients that make a small amount of Lewis Y on their cells. And we got some support from the US Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to perform a first in human clinical trial. It was, I believe, certainly the first CAR T cell trial ever done in Australia. I think the second gene therapy trial ever done in Australia. And uh, basically we enrolled five patients. It was well, the treatment was well tolerated. We got two transient responses, which are, are sort of neither here or there in, in the sense of that wasn't the end of the trial. But there were some fantastic things that came out of it. We managed to get T cell persistence uh, here at PCR assay, but we could get persistence for at least 10 months. One of these patients actually lasted two and a half years or survived two and a half years, which was unusual. We, we saw transient increases in plasma cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF, uh, even in the bone marrow, and some IL-2, which was encouraging. But this is the result that uh, really um, was exciting for us, where a, one of the patients developed a itchy and, and quite painful rash on their forearm. And when this was biopsied, it turned out that these T cells had localised to cryptic sites of leukaemia in the skin. So this is, a, this is a condition called leukaemia cutis. So normally you have leukaemic cells in the blood and in the spleen and the lymph, node, lymph nodes and so forth. But on biopsy, we were able to show by three different techniques by PCR, by, by H&E staining, and by immunohistochemistry, that we actually had these cells tracking to and encountering tumour, which to us uh, was very, very significant and exciting. So we've published uh, this paper. It's been well picked up. And in fact, it was picked up by a company called Juno Therapeutics in the US. And they actually approached us. And now they've licensed our technology. And in the next couple of months, we're, we hope to open a phase 1B trial in Lewis Y positive lung cancer. And I'm delighted to say on Friday we've got notification that we've passed TGA uh, and we also have ethics, so we're virtually ready to go and on track to open that trial before the end of the year. Okay, so um, CAR T cells may not be enough, they probably won't be enough, so we're looking down the track. Uh, combination therapies, uh, CARs plus various things, I think are probably the next thing that will be tried and we've got some, um, some lab evidence that that, will be, that may be effective. There are a whole uh, series of other checkpoint inhibitors that could be tried, either in an antagonistic or an agonistic way. And then I haven't mentioned at all the whole area of the tumour microenvironment, which is a massive uh, area of research in its own right. So all of the various other things that tumours do to suppress, subvert, undermine, distract, and otherwise annoy the immune system. Okay? Uh, so there are many, many hundreds of labs working on all of that. So we think PD-1 might be worth try, trying with, uh, with anti-HER2 CAR T cells, uh, we, we, either the vector alone or the cognate CAR T cells. If you combine them with anti-PD-1, the, the mice do far better and they survive for longer. And then there's the microenvironment. So we would envisage um, perhaps even coming up with triple therapies where we could combine things like the CAR T cell, PD-1 blockade, and then neutralise uh, some uh, dominant uh, pathway of the tumour in the microenvironment. So here's a CAR T cell hitting the tumour. We would also block anti-PD-1, that increases gamma interferon and, uh, and, uh, and immune uh, effector molecules like perforin and granzymes. And then we would also block <coughs> immunosuppressive molecules like adenosine. And at the end, uh, you can wipe out the tumour. 
So there are all sorts of other challenges and opportunities. Cost is a big one and how you produce these cells. In the interest of time, I'll move to the last slide and just stress a couple of things. So all of these therapeutics don't fall from the sky. We've got to support basic research because all of these therapeutic advances all started with a lot of basic research and much of it in the end has to be tried and it may or may not work. CAR T cells took us 15 years to get to clinical trial, but it actually is an approach that works. And then I think finally the promise of the VCCC partnership. So um, there was an announcement a few weeks ago from state government that there'll be a new immunotherapy for cancer centre on level 13 of the new building. And I am very, very um, thrilled uh, that we'll be collaborating with all of you and all our partners here to do some great things for cancer patients. Thank you. Joe. So that's great to bring home our um, three-part sampler of some of the immunology research that's going on in the precinct. I'd like to invite all of the speakers now up to um, the stage where there will be an opportunity for people to ask questions of any of the speakers for the next few minutes. My um, uh, comments and, qu uh, and question is really to say to Peter and, and Joe, um, it seems to me that we're going through the same sort of story with PD-1 and CTLA-4 that we went through with interleukin-2, in that initially, uh, you know, interleukin-2 was the master cytokine, pro-inflammatory cytokine, gives complete responses 7% of the time in melanoma, late-stage melanoma and late-stage renal cell carcinoma. And now uh, we see that, you know, IL-2 receptor was on T effectors, now it's on, it was, then it's shown to be on T regs, PD-1's on effectors, it's on T regs, CTLA-4, same sort of story. How do you see this sort of thing panning out, that we're attempting to take the brakes off uh, a homeostatically regulated immune response, but we could actually be suppressing, further suppressing it with interfering with these receptors on Tregs? I'll answer your question this way, which is to say that, um, which is to say that um, when we treat patients with these agents at the moment, only a minority of patients respond, and therefore, um, biomarkers for selecting which patients will respond and even working out which biomarkers to use is an incredibly important, very diff difficult and fraught uh, issue. If you even take PD-1 or PDL one there's not even a strong correlation with the, with the overt signs of expression of that molecule in the tumour or on the immune system. So it's transient, it jumps up and down. And uh, so I will answer your question in a general way because I can't answer it specifically to be frank by saying that we need to take into account um, host and tumour factors. Uh, so there are, um, there are germline factors in the host and there are many somatic factors and somatic mutations that occur in the tumours, all of which impinge on the likelihood uh, of a response. And that's not even taking into account polymorphisms across the entire human population because that's something we often forget as well. If we weren't polymorphic, if we weren't all different, we'd all probably be knocked off by the next virus that comes along. And so I'd say our response to cancer is also predicated by that as well. So, for, sorry, very general <laughs> answer, but you're right. I mean, in the end, you don't want to get off, knock off um, pathways that might be already activated and might be suppressing the tumour. So obviously, so one acknowledgement of that is that patients who advance rapidly when they're treated with this way have to come off study. Mm. But of course... Uh, it's justifiable ethically, I would say, because in the end these patients have been through and failed every other therapy and we know uh, from, you know, um, decades and, and in fact centuries of treating these conditions that they're otherwise uh, universally fatal. But, but Joe, would, would you really want to wait until they fail every other therapy before you try any PD-1 because you really want your T-cells around, wouldn't you? So this is the question. Um, currently, um, we are still, um, we're, you know, we want to get to the Olympics and do the cycle, get the cycling gold medal, but we're running around with, tra with training wheels on a little monocycle. We don't really know yet uh, how we're going to use these, um, these approaches in earlier forms of the disease. Uh, ethically, you've got to start with advanced disease and, and actually work backwards. But in terms of, uh, particularly in high-risk diseases, uh, say stage 3 melanoma, some forms of colorectal cancer, you would think that once you get the patient into remission, to prevent relapse, these forms of uh, approaches, these approaches may be particularly effective. But unfortunate, well, whether it's unfortunate or not, ethically, the only way you can do those studies is to work backwards. Professor Harrison, can I ask you about the work that you were doing on the gut micro? Um, 
You mentioned about uh, being able to pick it up in children that were three years of age. Can I ask you how you were measuring that? And was there an actual spike at about five years of age on that measurement system? Yeah. Um, what I was referring to was the measurement of um, antibodies, autoantibodies in children, and saying that <clears throat> when they appear, um, well, they appear very early in the first few years of life in children who are going to get type 1 diabetes by the age of 18. Um, and when I referred to the microbiome, the gut microbiome, I, I was saying that it's altered in those children. And um, at the moment, all we know is that in the children who are um, autoantibody positive between the time that that's detected and the time they develop type clinical type 1 diabetes, there is an alteration in the gut microbiome. We really don't know much about what's happening before then. But it's not just a, a constriction of the number of different um, bacteria in the gut, it's also a change in the composition so that um, specific ones are either present or not present and so it it's really interesting and you know what's going on is uh, the, how this might uh, affect the development of autoimmune disease is not yet clear but it's known that um, some of the gut bacteria that are missing make anti-inflammatory factors like short-chain fatty acids um, butyrate propionate acetate and uh, collaborators at monash um, dr eliana um, uh, Marina and her colleagues and Charles Mackay have been studying the, the mouse model here and showing that by changing the bacteria in the gut you can also um, prevent the development of type 1 diabetes in the, in the mouse. So the prospect is that in the future we might be able to intervene with very specific probiotics that might alter the gut microbiome composition and reduce the risk of development of uh, type 1 diabetes and other immune disorders. Um, certainly that's going on to some extent now um, uh, after caesarean sections. Um, it's been shown that women who have caesarean sections, um, if they re if they colonise their gut with vaginal bacteria, um, there's, a, there's evidence that it's going to reduce the incidence of allergies anyway. Um, so it's a very promising field, but it's, it's, it's burgeoning and it's really... Um, just in its infancy. And have you looked at the polyvagal theory and the impact of stress on those early years? Um, I can talk, talk to you about the influence of stress on the microbiome, but um, in terms of type 1 diabetes, I'm not aware of any good evidence that, um, that stress, um, the way we measure it, uh, contributes to the onset or precipitates the progression of type 1 diabetes but I mean I think we need to keep a very open mind about this because there is evidence in the mouse again this is our common experimental model that stressing a mouse in various ways during pregnancy stressing the mum has very significant effects on the microbiome and at least alters the uh, neurocognitive development of the offspring so I think you know there's enormous possibilities in that field but I'm not aware <coughs> of any um, clinical data that says that stress accelerates type 1 diabetes in humans. And we also briefly want to touch on diet, since you touched on the short chain fatty acids, so fiber intake and susceptibility to diabetes. Yeah, well, um, so the, the, the classic experiment, N equals 1, uh, done by a colleague in London was he sent his son to uh, McDonald's for 10 days and the gut microbiome uh, diversity decreased by 30 to 40 percent. Um, so uh, McDonald's you know uses six ingredients right and um, traditionally we should be eating 50 or more. Um, so that's that's one thing to be to be you know smart and facile about it um, but no it's um, Clear, clear that the composition of the diet is very important. So high fibre diet, um, fibre used to contribute um, 
a very significant amount um, in our diet. It's now dropped dramatically over the last you know, 50 or 60 years. Um, fiber is, um, undigested fiber is fermented in the large bowel to these short chain fatty acids that are protective. Um, they're also protective against colon cancer. Um, and there are other components of the diet that we need to be aware of too. I mean, um, all of the food add additives, preservatives, emulsifiers, <coughs> artificial sweeteners, they all alter the gut microbiome and we don't really understand what that's doing. So I think we all need to revert to a very you know, primitive diet of uh, grains, green, green coloured things, vegetables and, <laughs> and fruits. Um, firstly, I, I would like to thank all of you for a great summary of the immune system and for the audience. Thank you very much. Now, I'm following up on um, a question to Len, but actually from Joe's talk. Um, so PD-1 really actually has been discovered initially, I think, in the context of autoimmunity, and then it was sort of um, uh, hijacked, I think, by the tumor immunology immunity, uh, com community. So I'm wondering, is there any uh, more... Um, research going on to use to activate PD-1 or CTLA-4 uh, to to uh, treat autoimmunity early on. Uh, I'm not aware of that, um, but I, you know, it's clear that it uh, plays an important role on regulatory T cells, and it's necessary for regulatory T cells. Um, we're actually in the lab looking to see whether altering, uh, um, you know blocking or agonizing PD-1 makes any difference to autoimmune responses uh, ex vivo in blood because it's very difficult for us to um, actually demonstrate T-cell reactivity um, in the blood of humans with autoimmune diseases. I mean, celiac disease, which is a sort of an autoimmune disease, is an exception, but, um, you know, we're, it's, it's a biomarker problem and we're trying to see if we can overcome that by manipulating PD-1 and other markers of um, senescent cells like LAG3 and we heard today CD38 and TIM3. But I'm not aware of any trials, but it's a, certainly a good area. One of the first places it was picked up was with uh, persistent virus infection, immune exhaustion of CD8 T cells. We found to be PD1 positive and then, uh, of course, that application has gone on the cancer. Group. Yeah. Well, analogous to that might be... Um, exhaustion of cells, senescence of cells in response to persistent autoantigen stimulation as well. If, if I could just uh, qu quickly ask a question. Catherine, um, the flu vaccine is something that, that people often discuss. You talked about the importance of having a good T cell response for protection against the flu. Do you think the flu vaccine is, is helping or hindering the generation of a good T cell response? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a difficult one to answer. So obviously, it's important to get immunized, uh, vaccinated against flu to protect children, elderly. Um, and it gives us good, although highly strain-specific protection. But for now to get the broad immunity, broad protection delivered by T-cells, infection, influenza infection is the only way. But the current flu vaccine is a kill vaccine, so it will tend to suppress the CD8 T cell response and the type of cross protection that Catherine was talking about. So um, several years ago, at least in Britain, uh, there was a big move to move towards light attenuated vaccines, which would give you some CD8 T cell response. There's also some concerns about injecting a lot of influenza protein into children because we sometimes get some really bad bad effects. So there's a long way to go with developing better flu vaccines. They're not great vaccines. The, the, but they, you know, I get vaccinated all the time because I'm an old guy and old guys get killed off with flu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting Alzheimer's. Sorry, this... Thanks, I'll get the second one in. To Len, um, that was really interesting about uh, the mice that were down on your farm in Yarra, in Yarra Valley opposed to the wee high ones and then the... The, uh, the very clean environment. So, I didn't say that. 
But, but, but I mean, I'm thinking, well, do we send all these kids down to your farm in the Yarra Valley to, you know, get, get a bit more sunlight and a, and a, a bit of cow shit and, and stuff like this? What about the Russian poop that on sale in the pharmacy? Is that going to happen? Is well, there are trials of faecal transplantation underway, and we need to get a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, <laughs> But I, but, I, but I think uh, people underestimate the, this whole area. I think it's really an important um, feeding ground for these chronic inflammatory immune disorders. And um, I mean, only by doing long-term studies, longitudinal studies, uh, will we actually be able to show and prove that and do something about it. Um, yeah. I mean, I was fascinated. It's 55%, you know, half dead, half dead. Yeah. Well, there's evidence, you know, paradoxically in early life from animal studies mainly, or totally actually, that immune stimulation very early in life is protective. Um, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't try and translate some of these findings to prevention. Thank you very much. Don't, don't, uh, you shouldn't think of that as a reason for not vaccinating cats because, <laughs> because basically our human lifespans have been increasing and increasing and increasing, um, even before this. Big events and same cancer therapy and so. All right, I, th I think it's uh, oh, we ha we have one quick question. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the connection between psoriasis and uh, diabetes. If you get one, are you likely to get the other? Yeah, there's a higher a co um, prevalence of of those diseases for type two diabetes, yeah. not type one diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is also an inflammatory disorder of a different sort. It's just that it um, doesn't result in a targeted adaptive immune response uh, to the beta cell. But it's associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes is associated with activation of the innate immune system um, that Peter Doherty mentioned in his talk. But I don't, under, I don't know, I don't think anyone really knows why there's a co-association. I'm not aware that it's genetic, um, as there would be, for example, with type 1 diabetes and celiac disease. Um, but it's certainly, you're definitely right, there is an association. In fact, um, a, a PhD student who just finished a PhD with, with me, um, a lady from Iran, um, is staying on and um, that's actually the subject of her... Uh, postdoctoral studies, uh, together with myself and uh, another person in, in the institute um, called James Vince. So maybe in five years' time um, we can tell you what the mechanistic connection is. It really just remains to thank our um, three speakers and Peter for giving a wonderful introduction and also Len, Catherine and Joe for great presentations to give us a sample of what's going on and your wonderful insight into these diseases. I would also like to take the opportunity to, th to thank my co-chair, Sammy Badui. Thank you very much, Sammy. And um, also, thank you. Thank you to Rebecca Elliott, the communications manager, and also to Sharon Lewin, the director of the Peter Doherty Institute and the director for allowing us to hold this event here. And thank you everybody for coming along to hear this event. Um, we'd love your feedback on the, on the occasion and there'll be more events in the future as well. So thanks everybody, have a good night.